Welcome to Agile Roots 2010. Sponsored by Version 1, Rally Software, Vireo, Amirsis, Agile Alliance, and Xmission Internet. Agile and User Experience Design by Dan Harrelson and Todd Wilkins. to get um, sort of agile processes and user experience kind of processes together, um, sort of both successes and failures, I guess you might say. Um, one thing I wanted to say before we dive into this is that um, we actually have a lot of slides because we wanted to go through some case studies, but in seeing some of the sessions today, there's been a lot of really good conversation. People have asked some really good questions, which just kind of led the conversation in a sort of a direction that seemed like it might be more relevant to people in the room. So I, we want to encourage you guys to, if you have questions or, or thoughts about things, just feel free to raise your hand or, or, or step in, because if we don't make it through all the slides, it's probably better if we talk about things that everybody here is actually caring about. Um, and we'll make sure that we cover the stuff that we think is the most important here. We have this kid pass example, all right? Great. <clears throat> so um, I always start, because we, go, we, we see at conferences that aren't really pure designers, mostly. And so uh, when we go places that we're not full of design folks, I always want to make sure that they kind of know who, who the heck who the heck we are. Um, I don't know. Does anybody here know who Adaptive Path is? Somebody probably <coughs> here. So we're a uh, we're a user experience consulting firm. Uh, this is our sort of mission statement, you might say. Um, we help teams and organizations create products and services that deliver great experiences to improve people's lives. Um, and I know it sounds like just like a marketing phrase, but it's actually something we very much um, drive our decisions about what we do and our practices, the, the projects we take. Um, uh, and we do a lot of different things in order to try to meet that mission. Um, <clears throat> we do a lot of consulting work, which we'll talk about a bit today, but just so that you guys sort of understand a little bit more about us. Um, we also do a lot of events, we put on conferences, we do trainings all around the world, uh, trying to teach people how to do user experience work. Um, we work with developers, business analysts, uh, uh, marketing folks, like I, I, can't, I think I've worked with almost every kind of person that tries to make a technological artifact. Other designers. Yeah, other designers, trying to help them understand how to, to get good experiences out in the world. Um, we also try really hard to share everything that we've learned. Our books, we put on conferences and uh, write articles and that sort of thing because we feel like everybody gets better, including ourselves, the more of our, the more ideas we get out for people to try to, to try or react to. Um, so just so you kind of know where we come from. Um, and then the, the other thing, which I think is always important to us, and just so you understand why we even come to conferences like this, to talk to people who are, generally speaking, a bit different than us, um, is, is that impact is really big for us. We choose our projects based on how kind of impact they can have on the world, positive impact. So, and, and at the end of the year, we often sit down and do some kind of rough back of the napkin calculations about like, these are the projects we successfully completed this last year or two. How many people do we think we helped? And they're very rough, you know, like so the last couple years, we helped about 300 million people. Um, that's about 8.6 million people for each one of our employees. And that sort of, I mean, it's a back of the napkin measurement, but it's something that we spend a lot of time thinking about because we want the work that we do to really be impactful. Um, so um, that's why we're glad to be here and share our experiences with you because we hope that that will also help have a positive impact on the things that are getting made out of the world. Uh, so that's adaptive path. So then the question might be, who the heck are Todd and Dan? And uh, this, this is who Todd and Dan, I don't know. I didn't switch that back and forth, but um, I'm Guy Todd. Um, I'm a UX designer. I'm also the director of our studio in Austin, Texas. Um, I, uh, I always like to share some of these things because I'm the designer. Um, I thought everybody here would be interested in knowing that um, I actually have a computer science degree back in back in the day. I actually have done things like coding the kernel of a multitasking operating system from scratch. So I don't do those things anymore. Um, I think I would be really worried if my life depended on doing something like that today. But I have done it before, so I can at least, I can understand that I, I, have, a, I have a sort of strong kinship with the sort of development mentality. And uh, uh, I also like to move my own people. I like to make stuff and just don't get to code anymore. Um, and then uh, Dan, I'll, I'll go pass it up to you. Sure. you talk? So um, as it says there, I, uh, I'm jealous of Todd because I don't brew my own beer. I like to drink really good beer. Um, I drink his. Um, someday maybe I'll get a chance to do that. Um, I'm a design technologist. I work out of our San Francisco office. Um, the term design technologist is pretty sort of uh, explanatory of what it is. I've spent about half of my career in education actually coding and building and, and, and working in development and architecture. I spent about half of my career designing uh, user experience design, everything from 
uh, for research, to interaction design, et cetera. Um, sort of my interesting tidbit here is that um, even though I have you know, written JCB code and you know, schemas for databases, I also just recently spent a couple of weeks tooling around um, all, all different parts of the UK talking to small business owners about what they're looking for and doing collaging and doing in-depth ethnographic research. So I kind of have both of those, those <coughs> backgrounds that I bring, I bring to the table here when we're working with our clients. Um, so with that kind of background about who Adaptive Path is, who I am, who Todd is, kind of what we're bringing to the table here, um, let's dive into the meat of this and, and tell you a bit about what we're hoping to talk about today. Um, in general, um, what we're trying to, uh, to raise some awareness about, I think, is this <coughs> that um, through our experiences, through some, some research that we've done, um, through, uh, through consulting work, et, et cetera, um, we actually think that, that the, the processes that user experience designers take and the processes that agile developers tend to take are a lot more the same than, than different. Um, hopefully we can, we can kind of uh, talk about some of those things. We'll, we'll dive into a bit of the, the differences as well um, to make sure that we, we sort of highlight you know, the ways that maybe people who are you know, more into code and those who are more into you know, look and feel um, kind of think differently and, and then talk about maybe some ways that we can use some tools and techniques to help uh, bridge those gaps, help have people have a shared uh, vocabulary and have better conversations so that when, if you're in a, in a dev team uh, and you need to work with, say, the, the US team, then you can, you can better you know, share ideas and, and end up with a, a better product at the end of the day. Um, as Todd mentioned, we really want this to be very um, conversational, so feel free to jump in, ask questions, you know, call BS on something if you don't believe me, that kind of thing. Um, so let's start off by kind of getting the, the stereotypes and then that kind of thing out of the, out of the way. Um, everybody sometimes maybe will think about, you know, who's your classic kind of developer, who's your classic designer, maybe something like this comes to mind, right? You know, the Apple guys. Um, maybe it's something a little bit more like, you know, your, your developer is your, is your engineer who's kind of in the data center and coding away, your designer is, you know, got a lot of stickies and you know, Apple computers and that, that, that sort of thing. Um, you know, these, these may be sort of two ways that in reality people are seeing, um, seeing each other, right? That somebody who is a designer and somebody who is a developer kind of sees the other party. Um, often, they also see each other this way. They see each other as the person whose job it is to say no, right? A developer's job is to tell a designer, no, that cannot possibly be done. A designer's job is, is, is to tell the developer, no, you can't do that because the user will hate it, right? Um, this is it. This is this is reality. Some of some of this is actually happening out in the world, and this is what we're hoping that we can we can maybe overcome a little bit by identifying, you know, that these are the cases that we actually do have more in common, and, and maybe try to develop techniques to kind of uh, to kind of uh, uh, get over these hurdles. Sometimes even we see developers and designers in this way. You know, they're on opposite sides of a big waterfall, right? Certainly, people in this audience, you know, uh, you know, are not are not working this way, right? Everybody has a nice, pure, agile, very collaborative kind of work environment, but you know, maybe maybe there's some other place, you know. Um, the place uh, you worked before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you have some friends that work places like that. Um, you, know, you know, maybe maybe you see each other this way, right? You see each other somewhere at the end of an email, you know, at the end of the department, maybe on the other side of the campus, that kind of thing. Um, so sort of knowing that, that we do have some of these preconceived ideas about how designers, developers, UX, Agile, maybe, maybe are, are different. Um, we can dive into some, some quick level setting about how Todd and I um, uh, are, are looking at, um, at the world of Agile, the world of design, um, uh, when, we were, when we were thinking about this sort of problem of how did the two get to talk. Um, we, we're not Agile experts, you know, Agile with a, with a big capital A here, you know, we kind of work Agilely, um, but sort of, you know, we, we, we have a, 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 an okay understanding about sort of the world that you guys are living in, you know, we understand that there is this, there's this Agile, <coughs> there's this idea about, you know, uh, getting software out into the world, getting it in front of users, you know, about, about uh, short iteration cycles, things like that. We know that there's a lot of philosophy tied up into into Agile, right? We know that this is this is sort of bound up with with the whole world, and, and it's not it's not done simply because um, it, it's done it's done because everybody really thinks that it is it is the best way to be creating great software, right? There's there's a lot of a lot of uh, yeah a lot of kind of overarching philosophical ideas that go along with it. 
there's also you know logistical ideas that got come along with with agile, right? It, it, it actually manifests itself in in certain certain processes and certain techniques that that take this this philosophical idea about how to build software and actually execute it upon it. And then, you know, so we we didn't want to tell you about agile because you already know about agile, right? And we are we don't know that much about it, but we can tell you a little bit about it. That's sort of where we're coming from. Like, all we really felt like we really the, what we run into the most is uh, an understanding of what the philosophy is, right? But what we can tell you a little bit is what we mean when we talk about design, because that may be something you guys have less less experience with, or at least not something you maybe do on a daily basis all the time. Um, and but I want to start off actually by talking a little bit about what, what when we say design, what we what design is not, as far as what we're talking about. So I like about five ways of thinking about design, four of them which I think are not going to be helpful in this conversation, but I want to get them on the table so that then we can ignore them explicitly. Um, uh, so the first one is um, seeing design as aesthetics. It's about sort of the beauty of the of the shape, of the form, of the color, of the of that. We're not talking about design as aesthetics, though that aesthetics are important in design. Um, we're not talking about design as a distinct role. We're not talking about that guy with the with the kind of spiky hair and the cool tennis shoes out down the hall. He's trying to figure out why he what he does with all of those post-it notes. Like that's that's also not what we're talking about. Not that specific role. Um, not talking about design as a thing. People often talk about industrial design and design as a sort of artifact. It's not what we're talking about. Um, and then we're really not talking about the idea of design as sort of the rock star designer type. Um, that's not what we're talking about either. Um, so if, when we say what is design, it's none of those things. What is what is it we really want to say design is? What do we mean when we talk about design over the course of the next little bit of, of time? Um, we talk about design as an activity. Design is a <laughs> it's something that you do, right? And it's something that can, it's an activity that an organization can embrace, it's something that everyone can do, and I know that all of you do design, right? You guys use the word design probably every day in your, in your life. You talk about designing software, you talk about designing an architecture, you talk about designing a database schema. Design is an activity for adding some structure, using creativity, creativity to create a sort of structure or a tangible artifact based on a certain set of constraints. That's, that's what design is. And then you just do it in different contexts. Um, and the activity of design is the thing we actually want to talk about a lot today, because it's the thing that actually has so much in common with what has kind of developed in the Agile world as well. Um, the nice thing about design, though, is that when, when you focus on the design as, a, as an activity and you look at the, as design as something that everybody does, a designer, who might have that title or something in an organization, ends up being a facilitator. It ends up being their job to help everybody go through this process and do this activity. So they engage sort of cross-functional Teams, they get design, design ideas out of them, then they work to refine them and hone them. Like that, that process there, if I didn't attach a designer to that, that sounds very much like the kind of thing that a lot of sort of agile development processes are doing, right? You get, get a cross-functional team, you get, the, you get some ideas out, you start to refine them, right? Um, and so if that's what design is, what is UX design, all of, all of that is, is a design with a specific focus on users and the overall qualities of the experience. Why do I make this case? Well, this is actually the point when, you, when I think you begin to see where there could be similarities, some points of agreement between what we have seen from Agile. When I use the word Agile, I think I'm gonna continue to just reinforce that. We only mean little a. Um, uh, in Agile development environments, or Agile sort of uh, software development environments, and so I wanted to start off by talking a little bit about what those points of agreement might be. <clears throat> um, and there's two really big ones, I think. Um, iteration and a focus on the user. I think that that's a pretty well established part of the, of the agile development process. You want to iterate through things quickly. Um, there's a huge focus on user stories, which is actually not the kind of thing you necessarily find in a lot of other development approaches. Um, I think the other thing that's really interesting is that the sort of philosophical aspect of agile is is actually, it comes across in the sense that people who are doing agile development spend a lot of time explicitly reflecting on the process that they're going through and why it might be the right process to go through. And user experience designers often try to do the exact same thing. They try to think about what we're doing and why we're doing it now in order to get the best results out of it. So those two kind of perspectives are things that are very much in common between the two, uh, two these, these two sort of uh, um, fields that, that developed from completely different places. They just sort of ended up in a very similar place uh, now, and one of the things that I think actually helps to make this case, and one of the reasons why I like, why I believe this is true, some of you must look slightly skeptical, but that's okay, because I think I can prove it to you. Because um, we had, we actually had a 
really, they had, a, they had the sort of advantage of actually being paid to do a really interesting study, research study, about designers and developers and how they work together. Um, and uh, it was actually one of, the, one of the best projects I've ever done. So it was a lot of fun and so amazingly insightful and it made me change the way that I work, actually. And um, interestingly enough, this project is Microsoft. Um, as you guys probably may or may not know, uh, Microsoft has been developing tools and platforms for, the, for as they call the web designers, um, for a few years now. So Silverlight, WPS, they've got the .NET framework, they've got this whole expression suite of tools that they've been developing. Um, and after a, couple, after a couple years of working on it, they realized that they didn't understand people who were creating what they call sort of web, web designers as well as they would have liked. And when they use the word web designer, what they really mean is people who are making kind of rich, networked applications that may or may not run in a browser. Um, so that so while I say it's not websites, it's actually something more complex than that. They actually use, uh, they talk about rich internet applications. I don't know if anybody feels like they know that or has worked on something called a rich internet application. Basically, it just means it's a, an application that has some media in it and has the internet connected to it, which is slowly becoming every application. So, um, so the things that we learned about these people actually should, if they don't apply to you today, they will probably apply to you very soon. Um, what they did is they came to us and they had three questions. And I simplified these, but it was really quite this simple. What are designers? What do they do? What do they make? Um, how are designers different from developers? Because Microsoft feels like they understand developers really well. Um, huh? <laughs> well, at least a certain kind of developer. Um, Yes, that's fine. That's fine. I just, they, they, they believe that they understand developers really well. So I just can't, I can't deny that. Um, uh, they wanted to know a lot about what these people, what the differences are between the, what the kind of work that they do and how they approach their work. Um, and then they wanted to know about their workflows. Um, so, so what we did is we went out and we did a bunch of field research um, all across the country. We uh, talked to designers and developers and managers and people of all sorts of different roles in small companies and large companies, agencies and like large uh, enterprise organizations, you name it, we probably talked to them. Um, and we spent a lot of time with them to understand what their process was. They showed us their artifacts, that we talked to people, on multiple, multiple people on given teams. We go to an organization and talk to two or three people and different roles on the same team. So we could really just get a sense of what they were doing and why they were doing it and how they were approaching it. And what came out of it was that we, we got four basic archetypes of people in these processes, and I think that you guys will end up feeling like you know some of these people. Um, they may have a different name in your organization, but you will have run into all of these people at some point. All right, you probably know someone who looks kind of like them. Um, so who who are these who are these people? I'm not going to go through the great detail here, but I just want to kind of kind of point out the architects because they're kind of important. So see Sean, the architect. Um, and when I use the word architect, this is not like a database architect. This is like somebody you might call an information architect someone who, in some places, they might be called your program manager or product manager. The, the person kind of makes the requirements or maybe builds the spec you're supposed to develop to. Um, this is somebody who's really, really focused on having a vision about something and helping to kind of give that vision to somebody to, to make. Um, you have people like Natalie, who we call the inventor. She tends to come from a creative background of some sort, but be much more wanting to get her hands dirty. So she's the person who may have a creative background, may be the kind of person who puts together specs and wireframes, but who also really likes to hang out with the devs mm -hmm. and talk about what's possible and like prototype stuff. She's the one who breaks out the sketchbook every time when somebody's trying to solve a problem. Um, so she's really, she's, she's really, she leads the creative effort, but she's really, she wants to get her hands dirty. Sean doesn't want to get his hands dirty. Um, and then on the other side, we have sort of two, two folks who tend to do what you might call development of some sort. We've got Greg, the designer's slash developer hybrid, which was an interesting thing we found. Um, and I think you guys will probably all relate to some people like Greg. Um, and we'll talk about him in a minute. Usually this is somebody who's come from a design background, probably started developing something in like Flash or JavaScript or something like that, and then slowly started kind of beefing up development chops until he was able to actually code stuff um, in, a, in a fairly like sort of robust way. Um, but he still kind of maintains that designer mentality, especially with a focus on users. And then James, we call him the creative coder because I think actually a lot of folks who come to this conference would be that, this kind of person. Someone who's solidly in the world of development, but is not somebody who wants to just kind of follow the old stage process of development and use the old stage process of tools. They see themselves as creative, but they, they're a builder. They want to build stuff, but they want to think about those things. They're the kind of people who will, in the middle of a development conversation, 
bring out something related to Russian literature because they see that it relates in some really important way. You know, that, that and so I think that the, that sort of the creative aspect of that coding is actually really important, especially these people would tend to be more agile than what your classic developer would be. Do these guys sort of make sense? Have you guys met people like this before? Anybody? A couple of you. A couple of you don't know anybody else like this at all. Um, they might become more make more sense to you as you start to see some of the quotes from them. I work with all four of them. Great, great. Somebody has worked with all four. So you can maybe give them give us anecdotes as we walk through if you know them. Um, also, get, I'm going to get past the details of this, this table. I don't think we need to dive into it. Um, because what's interesting is actually the trends that we found amongst these archetypes. So I'll start off with them. The first is this designer developer hybrid, because I think it's something that you're class that I think we all intuitively know they exist, but people don't talk about them quite as much. Most organizations don't want somebody who doesn't neatly fit into some sort of bucket. And people like the design and developer hybrid always do, always, they break the, the mold. So they're almost always someone who comes from the design, from a design background. So it's like the designer who starts to sound like a developer. You talk to these people and they would, the, the quotes are kind of amazing, they're kind of interesting. I'm pretty proficient in code, I spend 80% of my day there. This is somebody the organization thinks is a designer, he spends 80% of his day coding something. Um, the, this other one was a really great example. My hope is that some of the things that we're doing total abstraction frameworks are going to influence the way the rest of the company works. The make it pretty guys are going to determine how things are going to get built. Um, this mentality is really common. And these people are, are actually taking a sort of really forward role in the development of a lot of, 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 a, lot of these, um, a lot of these kind of rich applications. And they're also the ones who are breaking your standard processes, that kind of waterfall, because they see themselves having something to contribute all the way through the process, not just at one end of it. Um, so it's an interesting trend. You guys, does anybody in here think that this is sort of them? Does anybody put in this mold at all? Anybody? Does anybody know somebody like this that they work with? A couple, okay, great. I like the acceptor, so I assume someone knows how to make it. Um, conversational material. This is one that I think is, you guys might actually appreciate this one a bit more too. Does, does that sound like a really strange phrase, a like conversational material? Um, has anybody ever done any sculpting? Sculptors often talk about having a conversation with their material. It's a, it's, a, it's a common phrase in art. The idea is that you get a big block of granite, and you kind of have an idea that you want to make something out of it, you kind of know what the thing you want to make is, but after you start chiseling away at it and moving into it, you start to see things about the grain. You start to see, sort of see shapes or, or get feelings out of it, and as you start to do that, you actually change the nature of the thing you were going to make. So it's not like you start with a vision and you just make the thing. As you start to, as you start to work with your materials, you begin to change the thing you're going to make in order to respond to the, the things that those materials bring to the table. Um, and so, for example, when you see this, this is a sculpture partially through. Does anybody have any idea what this is going to be? Torso. Torso. Oh. Anybody else want to think of it? Yes, huh? Turtle. 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 Yeah. Turtle. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it actually is going to be a turtle. Right. For what it's worth. This is a process of somebody else. I, somebody I know did this. So it's, good, it's a good eye. But if you see this as a big block, it would have been really hard to yeah. Yeah, I think, um, and here's a Michelangelo quote. He says, I don't try to create a sculpture from a stone. I create a sculpture that's there and remove everything. So that is exactly the, that is exactly the, the sentiment. The, the, that, that's what this conversation is about. And, and it, it translates really well to code. Um, because you start to talk to someone, especially like Greg, and they, and, and this, what they want to do is acknowledge something that's been going on all along, right? right? I can't think of one time when a picture I had in my mind is what we ended up with on the screen. A lot of times it's because you stumble across or evolve into something that's better. And that's, that's, been, that's always been happening, although most, most software processes don't acknowledge that. And many design processes actually don't acknowledge that. They want to do all the design up front without ever touching anything in the code. Um, another thing that Greg has, somebody like Greg actually said, um, this process is actually really good when you're trying to do something really new using new technologies that you don't totally understand the capabilities of, um, because you have to you have to learn something about them before you can really design effectively with them. And the great thing, though, is that like certain design type folks actually really love this process too, because they realize that as things, get, as experiences get rich, the design can't be static; it's really alive. <coughs> and so, transitions, state changes, the shape and movement of things on the screen actually is a huge part of the functionality. And so, you need to be figuring those things out at the exact same time. So, someone like Natalie really loves this idea of the conversation. She's somebody who wants to get her hands dirty with materials to figure out how to do the right design work with it. 
And the thing that I thought was awesome in, in this is that we actually had a couple people who would use the phrase, like, they would say, I like, I'm doing some thinking in code. That's what I need to do. Like, some design folks would do this. This is my favorite, this is my favorite from the whole study. Coding is the sketching. Python is my thinking language. Right? This is somebody who actually works at a very, a, a relatively well-known boutique firm that does kind of crazy data visualization work. And you would imagine that when somebody came to a project with them, the first thing they would do would be like open up uh, sort of some some book about data visualization. I don't know if anybody knows Edward Tufte, yeah, yeah, something like that, where they would get up on a, on a board and they would start figuring out like what are the shapes going to be, what is color going to communicate, what is shape going to communicate. The first thing they do is they open something up and they connect to the database and they start to figure out what data is in there and what does this, what's the story the data is going to tell. And he starts to sketch through what he's going to create purely in the code. And it's only later that the visual kind of comes out of it. And I think that this is actually really indicative of what happens when you get rich applications. And it's very much the way that designers work. They just don't do it in code all the time. They need to get in there and start messing with things tangibly in order to understand what the design needs to be. So this trend was a really interesting one. It sort of speaks, in, my, in our minds, to the place where designers and developers are actually thinking very similarly. They just are using slightly different tools to do it. Um, so for example, like previously here, um, Natalie would have sketched something out and then start talking to a developer about what was possible, and then they would start prototyping something and they could go back and forth. Um, somebody else would just literally skip the sketching on paper and start sketching in code. And this has an interesting implication for the way the workflow works. <laughs> and and uh, what's interesting here is everybody we talked to, I, literally every single institution we went to, they told us, they used a phrase that was something like this. Agile seems to be the closest to what we are doing in and so none of these people were none of these people were strictly formal agile developers, nor had they necessarily adopted a strictly formal agile development approach. Though they all had a sense of what agile was about, and they all had a sense that that basic process. People used the word Scrum, although I wasn't really sure if they meant if they really knew quite what that meant. Like they, but they they were really into sort of this iterative process, and it seemed to be working really well for them. And I think I I, I put all four of these archetypes here to point out that three of them. Um, Natalie, Greg, and James all really loved that, and it made Sean really uncomfortable because he wants to want his answers. So like, he really likes the idea of doing like he knows he's having to do something agilely, but he really wishes he could just think about all of it and then give it to somebody to answer. Um, but they all had to acknowledge that it was the way they were working, whether they wanted to be working that way or not. Um, and so what, the, what what we saw were things like your sort of traditional waterfall models like this, where you design and hand off. Sean was like, yes. But everybody else in the process started telling a different story about this, right? We, they would sketch out something. Sorry, you can't do a sketch right But we had them all sketch the stories of projects, which is why you don't need hands on things. And uh, somebody who was like James, a, a coding person, came in and said, well, there's this first part of this project where we decided we would do it kind of traditionally. We'd split up the design and the development, and we would have them kind of, developers would work on like, you know, what's possible and feasible, and designers would work on how it's supposed to feel, and then we would reach this point where the designers would have the design done, and we would understand the basic platform, and then, We'd come together with like sort of monolithic stuff, and it would be this happy meeting, and then we would actually just build it. And what happened was he, he's like, well, when we pulled together, he's like, it was not so happy. And he said that they was everybody was frustrated. It was a room, it was a meeting where everybody sat in the room yelling at each other. <laughs> because because they hadn't been working together. Like they totally split those things apart. And they were they both had they both had a different idea about who owned what the project was going to end up being like. Um, so what they did is they said, okay, well that didn't work. Let's try something different. So for the next step, they, as he said, they started scrumming, and then everything started to go smoothly. He used the word scrum, but I really have this, like, and I don't know if like, I'll, I'll let my, my, my niece say, not you say, but I, so like, scrum probably has some more sort of specific meaning within the Android world, but he just meant, we did things really quickly all together in the same room in little bits. And, and he loved it. You could tell he had this huge smile on his face, on his face when he talked about it, and the designers we talked to in his organization also did. So whatever scrumming is to them, which I think approximates a lot of what the formal agile process is, it just totally worked. And the reason it worked is because um, they were trying to do something really new and really kind of innovative, and the only way to do it was to have the designers and the developers iterating quickly through ideas together. Um, and, and everywhere we went, people would draw us something that looked almost exactly like this which is like sort of, here's design and development, 
And if you can see here, so basically, there's just lines shooting back and forth between both of those all the way through. Um, and the reason was because what that ended up doing is kind of, it just, it was just like sort of iterated through. And it started at a kind of vaguer idea and slowly it, it added, it added fidelity until the end you had the real thing done. And it, it was just, it was amazing how powerful this was for them to, to work this way. Um, and they would say things like, there's no difference between backend and UE and UI people. Um, we're all saying, okay, this is how we work with this information. They all get in the room and they, and they work it out together. And these three folks were really, really happy working that way. And because more people were happy working that way, more good work was getting done. Um, and, uh, and I think the other reason it was working really well that we saw was that this process, this iterating through things quickly and sort of, uh, sort of collaboratively, was something that actually jived really well with what both designers and developers wanted to be doing. They actually just didn't realize before that they both wanted the same thing until they started doing it together. And, and having gone through this process, one of the interesting things we found was, and I think this would mean something to you guys, is like deliverables and artifacts. What is it? What are these people actually making that's helping this process go forward? Right? Like, what is it actually? What is the thing that comes out of a scrum look like? Or what is it in this process where the designers are really kind of trying to do the same thing too? And we found a few things out. Um, first one is like uh, Photoshop comps. Anybody ever work with a Photoshop comp? You know what that is? You know what that phrase means? It's like a static Photoshop file that's supposed to tell you what the interface looks like and possibly how it works. Um, comps definitely live on in this environment and there's two reasons. One is that Photoshop is essentially ubiquitous. And if everybody has it, it's sort of an easy coin of the realm. So everybody uses it. Um, the other one is that as you get into rich applications, you need a sort of high fidelity in the visual representation, and Photoshop's pretty good at that. It doesn't communicate function very well, but at least it, it can give you a high level of fidelity. And so people are trying to make it work. When it doesn't work, people often, uh, there are some problems. This is my favorite one. You couldn't build a Windows application like this. These people mostly work in the, Windows, in the web world, where that's more common. Um, but they're like, you know, what is that button supposed to do? Nobody ever told me. It just looks nice. Uh, in order to, to deal with this issue, we have this sort of uh, wireframes. Anybody work with wireframes a lot? Something like that? Are you a person who do wireframes? Um, wireframes are interesting. Wireframes seem to be mediocre at everything. Right? They, they provide more functional definition with annotations than you get in a Photoshop comp, but they're still really, really static. They don't change, they don't move, they don't show state well. And so it's really hard to have them be, really move a conversation along in this process. Um, and so you get quotes like this from the developer types. The UI expert makes wireframes and hands them off, but he does not bring a lot of value to me. Visio concepts aren't that useful. It's not that the design person is not having good thoughts. It's that somehow they're not being captured, communicated, or even sort of refined in a way that's effective for the, for the, for the, um, for the process. And so what we found that what seemed to be working better, and we'll talk about this a little more later, is um, something like uh, prototypes, demos, and interactive storyboards. And it's because they're dynamic, they're flexible, and they're something that you co-create. So this, this one, I actually really love this one, I'll sort of show you. This is somebody who's actually making a, a quick interactive storyboard in Keynote, because he can communicate the state and the changes really quickly super lightweight development environment as far as he was concerned as a designer, but it communicated so much more clearly in a wireframe with developers who could quickly take it and turn it into something that was much more real. Um, and this, this sort of led to a sort of common refrain, build, don't, comp. I don't know if you guys have heard. Um, my favorite, one of my other favorite quotes from this, when you make the comp and then the stuff, the comp can't learn from the stuff. But I think it's really true, right? And uh, most of these people sort of were leaning towards the idea of just trying to build things quickly because it just made things clearer. Um, so the, I think the, the big takeaways from this are, I can kind of see like, we, we learned a lot of stuff, probably not stuff that's like, some of the stuff was not gonna be like amazingly new to you, but what's really, I think the thing that, that, that what this should do is hopefully it exposes you to a few things you haven't seen before, but it also shows that it's really ubiquitous this kind, these kinds of experiences people are having because of how many different kinds of places we were able to talk to um, this kind of, this sort of, uh, sort of patterns that these people are, are, are trying to deal with. And all of them, as you can start to see, like, it all starts to move its way towards this kind of agile way of working, um, especially with the iteration. Um, but before
more like, but as much as they found ways that could work, there's also um, there's also some actually sort of real points of disagreement. I think also that that come up with between uh, designers and developers, especially the sort of UX designer and the agile developer. Um, and uh, I was going to talk about that because we uh, we actually have some um, experience of our own making some mistakes on projects working in an agile way that we thought we could share that so that you guys could hopefully learn from them. It took us a while to learn from them, but we, we have hopefully. <laughs> so yeah, um, you know, obviously this is this has been a, a case in a case study in, in you know understanding that you know UX designers and engineers are actually working a lot the same way that we're coming together that that the software development world is actually kind of uh, like converging onto agile processes, you know, um, anyways. Nonetheless, it's, it's probably worthwhile to, to point out, you know, as Todd mentioned earlier, there's something missing from here, right? Somebody was not really happy with, with, this, with this way of working, and that was Sean, that was sort of the architect person, right? There are, there are still people that, that, are, that are outside of this and are not totally comfortable quite working in this world yet, right? There are engineers who aren't really, really cool with jiving with with, with designers quite yet, that they're struggling with that. There's there's uh, UX designers who are having a hard time sort of you know, dealing with this this fast paced iterative process that that a lot of engineers are looking for. Um, so let's just kind of talk about those. Let's talk about sort of the ways that some of the baggage that that each group is kind of bringing to the table and and how that impacts the way that that they're that they're working. Um, a lot of times, you know, you, you you have your UX designers are focusing on different things than maybe an, an engineer would, would be. Um, they're, they're worried about sort of like creating concepts. They're, they're worried about things like, like what, is the, 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 what is the business need behind, behind this design and how this product is gonna work. They're, they're focused heavily, heavily on sort of user delight, on really you know, customer satisfaction, things of that sort. Um, a lot of times they couldn't care less about stuff that the, that the engineers are really focused on. Things like making sure it scales or making sure that, that it's maintainable over time. Or, or on, on just this, 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 this bulldog approach to like getting shipping code out there, to getting, to getting something live in front of people, right? They kind of have some different concerns, and that, that results in this, this sort of like, these, these perspectives of each other, you know, that, that aren't entirely accurate, but are sort of understandable, right? You've got your, your agile guy who's sitting here and saying, it needs to be quick and it needs to have, you know, it can't be like some sort of burden with our, with our heavy documentation. And we've got our, our UX de uh, designer who's trying to talk about, you know, oh, well, we really need to, to think about a, a big picture vision. And they keep talking about, you know, iteration zero, iteration zero, iteration zero. You know, I'm losing more time. You know, we can't sacrifice quality for speed. We really need to, like, to have this, this sort of focus. Um, and this is hard. I mean, this is hard for these, these groups to sometimes talk to each other because they have, they come, come with all this kind of baggage. They come with these, these different sort of understandings about the best way to get a product in the hands of the, of the users. Um, a way that sometimes there's a difference in, in between that, how the, the, two, the two groups are, are, are talking is in the way that they understand users. Um, a lot of times your, your UX designers are, are really wanting to, to, to go deep into sort of like <coughs> user understanding. Um, they, they really don't want to sacrifice that, that quality for the speed. They, they want to, uh, to st take, take a step back. They always want to take a step back and, and and be able to really understand sort of what are what are people trying to do with, with this application? How do they need this to work? Um, and and sometimes that that um, sometimes that that translates well into these discrete sort of user stories, these, these small elements. Sometimes you sort of miss some of the, the big picture when when you when you uh, when you take you know sort of user understanding and you chunk it into into small little bits. Um, it's it's really really hard to do a, a sort of a, a proper definition piecemeal. Um, it's um, sprinting through research, you know, and, and it can sometimes be very, very tricky. You know, you, you really sort of miss some of the big picture elements if you if you try and and try and do little pieces of research as you go. Um, specifically, what we're talking about here is, is not user testing. User testing actually is, is a tool that can be great for for doing iteratively, for getting in front of people, for getting quick feedback. You can get it daily, weekly, whatever. We're talking about really more uh, involved user studies, ethnography, you know, really seeing how people, you know, live and how they will, they will use the product that you're building in their day-to-day -day life, really kind of having that, bringing some of that, that, uh, that understanding and having that inform sort of the, the way that you're gonna build your product and, and define it. 
Um, hey Dan. Yeah, you, exactly. you and I were talking just before this, but I think that the, the one thing where I put out is like the agile development process seems it sort of assumes that you have a good understanding of your user, and then you can break it into the user stories and you start to design to it. And the, 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 the issue here is, is actually the question of like, what if you don't? What do you need to do to make sure that you do have that proper understanding? And that's a place where a UX designer oftentimes will want to come in and step back and take us go a little slower, try to get a bigger picture so that you make sure that you have that solid understanding before you move into quick iterations. But I, I, you, you make your point. I mean, that essentially, this is the case too, right? You know, it's, it's basically this: that, that there's a certain point when you need to um, you need to make sure your assumptions are right before you jump, before you before you go into the process. Um, and that's something that. But but it, but it, you know, every I think everybody needs to, to think about things before you jump jump into them. That's just, you know, but like there's a there's this is where a point of conflict often comes in. But like you said, you have to learn to say, let's step back. <laughs> Yeah. I just wanted to make a comment on that because I find it interesting. But uh, at least in Scrum, um, if if your product needs um, user experience design, which is most of the products, inside the team you need all this by definition. The team needs a group of knowledge workers who have this, the necessary skills to reach the vision. So the UX designer should be inside the team. And well, 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 uh, so, so, so that's the I mean, but that's the definition of uh, Scrum agility. Yeah. So, uh, what I think when you were referring to the usual software development team who are trying to use agility, um, and the product owner is represented as the, the, the purpose of the product owner is to maximize the return on investment. So, if you represent the interest. Of all the stakeholders, one of them is usually the customer who is the guy paying for it, and then you got sponsors, and you got users, right. and you got you got all sorts of stakeholders. So one of the usual uh, mistakes of software development teams is that you agility is uh, only showing things to customers. And just to kind of bounce back yeah. a little bit.
yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I'm, like, I'm just going to put down because the next part is where we can talk about what we screwed up. And I always like, I, I, I want to make, like, make sure we share. Okay. I really want to make sure we share the part where we screwed up. Because it's, it's very insightful. I, I think it's, you can learn from our screw up. Can I just have one quick question? Of course, yeah. Who's, 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 who's the danger? Is this something that the, that the, who forces this? Is, is it the US driver saying this, or you saying this, or? This is, this is a, a, probably a general sentiment from the US design community, and I think it's, it's definitely sort of a, a mindset that we have, right? That, that so this is the mindset of a traditional US, quote unquote traditional stereotypical US design. It is, it is, yeah, and, it, it is, it is, and I would say that, that both Todd and I probably feel this way as well, that, yeah. that the idea that doing, doing this sort of, uh, of in-depth, ethnographic, really deep understanding of users um, is hard to tackle. That's that, in a nutshell. That, that's sort of the notion, right? And so, and so, how does that work, right? And that's, that's just a conflict. I'm just putting it out there. That, that's what a, about that's a, forget about agile? What okay. about doing it iteratively? You're saying it's hard to do it iteratively. Mm -hmm. It's not hard to do iteratively. It's just the cycles have to be really long. Oh, well, well, maybe well, it's <laughs> well, it it uh, it took me. Uh, I did uh, research in four countries. It took me seven weeks, eight weeks. To deliver what? All the research insights so that we could understand all the users that we need to design these. But is that for delivering a software product? Yep. And did you revisit any of the research based Constantly. on the insights that you Constantly. Okay. No. What are your artifacts for that kind of thing? Uh, those archetypes actually you saw before were actually a really good example. I didn't show you everything for them, I didn't go into the details, but they're, they're personas. We're actually going to talk about some of the artifacts of deliverables and, and in a minute. But do you believe those are that really well. You, until, until you had just visited the seventh country, that you did not have position of making to even start building anything? Um, hmm. Because the, what the problem yes, is- Yes, actually I would, I would say that is true. Agile. I would say that's true. So you could not even begin to build a single line of code. Someone could have started building something. And that would have they might have had to redo it. Would have added value to would, the, would you to like your design it? insights. So the reason Clearly I'm there's a conflict <laughs> that we're talking about here. Because I'm going to use this yeah. Sure, yeah. Right. And so I'm pushing back at this. Yeah. This, to me, completely flies in the face of the fund is a fundamental agile as it has, in my opinion. Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. I covered, um, I mean, our fear, <laughs> the, the four of us who do that thing, is that <laughs> I have conducted um, a, um, a research study like maybe 20 years ago, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, <coughs> around lots, lots of countries and lots of software development teams. Um, maybe they were using Waterfall and they, they would have said something like this. Uh, you have to have like four months of analysis before, uh, and two, three months of design before you code. And they would have, I mean, uh, swear by their mother that, that that that's the way to do it. So and, and I think if you're doing the stuff for design, you definitely need to do it of that research before you. Oh, like yeah. the, the waterfall project would have gone much better. I think. So so uh, maybe our fear is that uh, I, I usually uh, do scrum training mm -hmm. and I usually bring people from other professions yeah. and they usually say no 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 we can do it this feature. And then when we start talking and uh, thinking about it, well, maybe. So uh, I think the initial mindset of the expectation is that it's more that it doesn't have any qualifiers. Yeah. The problem isn't that this may not be the case for some projects. Maybe, maybe this is that one edge case project where maybe you actually have to do seven weeks or whatever of, of, of front research. But you know, my experience having done this. do a lot of projects where there's no research on the front sure. because that project doesn't need it, doesn't right. warrant it. Right. So I'm perfectly, this is not right. every single, right. I mean, you Wait, you, said, you said you went to seven countries. Right? I went to four right. countries, four it took me about eight weeks to do so all this of is that. Like, this is clearly a This was a giant project, project. It, was, it was something that had never been built before, had never been done before. Mm -hmm. There was not, there was very little patterns in other software design we could build on. This was a set of users that we had met and not been studied, especially not in, the, in a very recent way. Right. Right. So this was, a, it was well, in, in one sense it's an edge case, it is, it is something that proves a little bit of a rule, which is that if you don't understand your users well enough, you need
need to be able to set the time aside to do it. Right. But yeah. that might be 5% of the case. Right. But would That's you, but I think would you say you get to this point in, in three days or a week or something like you I've only worked on one project where I had to go to four countries and spend eight weeks on it. Right. Yeah. And I've worked on a lot of projects. So you're saying understand your users. In one case, it got to seven weeks, but how many, like how quickly can you typically do it? What's the, you know, what, what, uh, that's a much longer conversation about how it. you approach research. <laughs> can I? I mean, we're going off here sure. in the other presentation. Uh, so you know, if we're building our stuff sufficiently uncoupled and using our agile processes, he can contribute greatly to what we need to do. Okay? He may need to do a process that isn't necessarily agile. Yeah. And we need that information, though. Okay? So let him go. Okay. Thanks. All right. Well, no, no, no. Your point is actually so. I, I don't want to shut it down. Let's just talk afterwards. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, all right. So just so I mean, of getting through all the, the slides, I'll press on, and we can continue talking for half an hour. We got a flight eventually to catch, but we can keep talking about this for a while. Um, so yeah, let's talk about when you don't do some of this. When you don't do a bunch of um, research and don't have a good understanding of your users, because we did it. Um, <laughs> So we had a client and we started working with them and we were doing everything right. We went in and we were doing agile design work. We were working with all of the right stakeholders where everybody was at the table. We were, we were coming up with concepts really fast. We were iterating on them. We we're incredibly collaborative. Um, we were doing all of our design work our, uh, very, very uh, well. We, go oh yeah, that's done. Um, the client, um, was a was a startup. They were they were incredibly fast paced. They already had a, a really strong team that could work together and could could scrum around you know these uh, these these ideas. And so they started um, instantly working on some of our concepts, getting their system set up, being able to to take the the, the designs that we were doing and, and being able to, to turn those into reality. Um, they were following you know the, the, some of the best practices. They were using all of the, the modern coding techniques. Um, they were they were making sure that they were focusing on the ability for their site to scale. I mean, it's ridiculous how much they were, they were working on working on that. Maybe a, a little bit too much. Um, nonetheless, they, they were doing all that right. I mean, they were they there was everything everything in the design, everything on the development was was right. We were really doing doing a good job there. Um, we launched it. We launched the site. You know, and and. They, were, they did an agile launch, they got it out quickly. They were listening to their users, they were taking feedback you know, um, on the blog and they, were, and they were within days you know, iterating a, a new launch of the site, iterating a new launch of the site, iterating a new launch of the site. They were, they were squashing bugs, they were, they, were, they were fixing issues, they were rolling out new features as they went. Everything that they were doing was right. And still, they had failures. We, they were getting, we, we were getting failures, right, absolutely. Um, the, uh, the response from the users was really, really negative. Um, they were th they were features on the site that were alienating current users. There were features on the site that were confusing new users who were being introduced to the system that were picking up on this, this all this buzz about a great new site launch that was getting picked up by TechCrunch and things of that sort. Um, we we did an overemphasis on sort of uh, expert decisions on on um, on picking up sort of personal whim and, and, and desires of of engineers that think think things might be cool, um, we essentially didn't do any sort of uh, any sort of upfront research. We didn't have a strong understanding of the users. We did zero user testing, and what's worse, we did it twice. So we did it for the website, and then we turned around, and six weeks later, we launched an iPhone app that had the same same problems, right? Um, so what I'm saying here is, is is we're not perfect. You know, we we fall into these same traps, and here's sort of a case study of of exactly what happens if you follow, you know, a lot of these sort of processes to, to the T, and yet you still end up with something that consumers are not adopting because you don't really understand them, right? The, the, the idea is, here is to make sure that you do understand your users, make sure that you have, you've talked to them, you've interviewed them, you really get what it is that they're, that they're looking for out of, your, out of your service, you're looking at your analytics, you're, you're doing what it takes to really get, um, to really get your users and build your features around around solving problems that they have with their service or, or in their lives. Um, so with that in mind, um, let's, uh, our, our final couple of slides here are, are talking about a couple of, of ideas that, that Todd and I have for possibly bridging 
um, the UX, service from a UX design and agile engineering. Um, a couple of, of activities, a couple of, of artifacts that might work well to be able to solve some of these issues around different you know, language issues between two, the two groups um, and, and things of that sort. Um, first one, Todd's gonna talk a bit about personas. Yeah, so somebody actually asked earlier about artifacts that you can create that can help capture the research and communicate them. I mean, everybody, a lot of people probably heard of personas, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, there are very bad personas that people do, and so they get a bad rap, and so I've seen very badly done ones. But if you do a good job on a persona, it can actually, it can be huge because, um, so what is a persona? When it's done really well, it's an archetype, right? So it, it represents a set of characteristics and traits that, that, are, that are found in your user base. So essentially, you can't, have, you can't always have your users sitting in the office with you um, all the time for your scrum meetings and that sort of thing. So you need something that's like a surrogate for them. And a really well done persona can actually be a really good surrogate for them. Um, and, but it's also one of the reasons why we work really hard to make our personas based very, very closely on people we actually talk to. We, we try not to give them, you know, we try not to have a persona named Elvis. You know, we try not to have a persona named, like, it's not making them funny and, and silly and kind of cool. You want something that feels very, very real because the empathy is the important thing. It's building that empathy. Um, so, but personas are great in this, in this bridging this because what personas are is they're characters, right? They're characters that can occupy different roles. I don't know if Leonardo DiCaprio could be Hamlet or he could be Horatio in a play. Um, a persona is, is sort of captures that kind of multifaceted nature of all real people, so they don't get stereotyped. <clears throat> and then what's great is once you have these characters, that's where you start to really be able to talk really well about how um, about things that are sort of really common to the agile approach, which is telling user stories, right? So there's user stories that are little little user stories, and then there's sort of bigger user stories, sort of scenarios where you're piecing these things together. Most of the user stories I've seen, the, the card versions of them are not, they don't, they're, they're more like actions. They're more like a plot without characters. And the key to personas is that they help bring the characters back into the plot. So that when there's some place where you need to interpret something, you can try to interpret it from that person's point of view. Um, and I, I've seen this prove to be hugely effective for developers and folks who may have not had as much opportunity to interact with users as someone who might be an interaction designer. Um, and it, and it, it really, it meshes really quickly and very easily in with the whole user story kind of ethos of agile development. So this is something I've, I've had a lot of good luck with and something that I really like to kind of um, put, sort of push as, as, as something to explore. And I, I've used it before in other situations. And you can start to talk about where the where it's really good. You know, you kind of, you have to develop them early when you're using the vision and they help you, help you craft the vision, but then they just keep popping up in really important places. And you're, even when you're doing user testing, once you have a good set of personas, you know who you need to recruit for any given user session, right? If we're working on the stuff that Donna uses all the time, we're gonna try to recruit a couple people that are like Donna, you know, or Rachel, or whatever that, that particular persona or person is. Um, so yeah, this is a huge, this, I found this, this is one of the most powerful things when it's done right, for helping to bridge that gap um, between the process and the team. So and another tool that we find a lot of value in um, are prototypes. Um, here's a quick snippet of uh, Prototype definition from Wikipedia. Um, uh, there's sort of two different uh, pieces here that are that can build a prototype according to this sort of definition. One is engineers and one is designers. I like to focus on the ones where designers are building some sort of a prototype. Um, if it's a prototype um, that that maybe is engineering focused, maybe that might be like more of a proof of concept, something where you're trying to prove how things will work. Um, if we talk about something like a design prototype. Um, then we're gonna maybe talk about um, the way that something works and the way it feels and it's, it's gonna be something that we want to we want to use to inform sort of the, the way that, that an application uh, 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 functions for a user and something that they can actually uh, they can actually test. Um, often when I think when I, when I talk to people about um, the best way to choose what you're going to prototype, um, uh, something like this helps to, to, to uh, describe that. Um, you often have, uh, features and functionality of your application that are critical. You often have ones that are really, really complex. Um, talk about those. Talk about the ones that, that are sort of out in that that world there of, of being very, very different than than maybe something that they're that they're used to, um, or something that is that is that is super important to your application. Right? Uh, if you're Twitter, probably being able to to uh, to get right the way that you can. 140 characters is like the most important thing that your site could possibly do. If you're gonna prototype it, prototype that. Um, don't prototype the login screen. Just do your login screen the way everybody else does the login screen and, and assume it's gonna be right. 
you know. Um, complex stuff, figure out, you know, what, what they say, five step process that someone's gonna have to go through, you know, maybe doing their taxes or something like that. Focus on prototyping the parts that are really, really tough so that you can put that in front of your users, get their feedback, and then iterate on, on what you need to, to do to make sure that that design is as tight as possible to, to make that complex seem simple. Um, so I have a couple of examples here. Um, Todd talked yeah. about this one. Sure, so th this is a prototype that's actually available. IDEO actually uses this as a prototype. It's for an endoscopic surgical tool. You know, anybody know what that is? Like during surgery, inside, um, somebody. And it was, they had the technology, they understood how that was supposed to work, but the thing they, they didn't know, you prototype the thing you don't know, you don't prototype the thing that you do. They knew stuff about materials, they knew things, a lot of that stuff, but they, they were like, what the heck is the form factor of this thing that a surgeon's gonna use? Right? Is it like a wand or a stick? Is it like a gun? Is it like a, how do they hold it? How is it supposed to feel? And so when they were trying to figure that out, they just, they grabbed what was around. Like this is a whiteboard marker, a film canister, and a little clip. And they put it together and like, and they were just walking with it. And they're like, does this feel right? I think they actually might've had a physician around that day for an interview. And they said, can you hold this in your hand and tell us a little bit about, is that feel like what it's supposed to feel like? And they realized right away, it was super quick. But they prototyped the one thing they really didn't know. And once they figured it out, they could start working on all the details of it. And I think this is actually a really great example of kind of how you think about, about what to prototype and how to do it. And this was like, I don't know that they needed a, a mechanical engineer or an industrial designer to do that. Right? They could do it very quickly without a whole lot of technical skill. Um, I'm gonna show you that one because I was I took it. So um, it sounds, it, the, what you see here is a, it's a box, a scotch tape, scotch tape box and a little tube. We worked on a project for a diabetic, a, a diabetes management system, and the designers were trying to figure out how to understand what it's like for someone to walk around with a um, insulin pump attached to them all the time. And uh, so they prototyped it. And what they did is they got a, a they got that box and they filled it with rocks and batteries so that it would be the right weight. And then they attached the they attached one of the things that they that, that people who actually have insulin pumps attached to them are, and they attached it onto a, the wire and they stuck it in their pocket the same way that everybody does when they have an insulin pump where they put it on their belt. And they spent two or three days walking around with it at the office and at home. It was like, what do I not know? I don't know what it feels like to walk around with a, piece, with a device like this attached to my body. And so they walked around with it for a long time. And, and what that helped them do is that it helped them know something they really needed to know in order to design the experience for the new device they were doing. Um, also a super simple thing to do, but you can see where the insight came from in that prototyping. And you can see why it doesn't matter if you're a designer or a developer or an industrial designer or whoever, this is the kind of activity that can help everybody get on the same page about what you need to be doing with your design process. The, the last one is actually more software based. This is a, this is a quick, it's like a comic we wrote. Um, for, uh, uh, have you guys ever heard of Lulu? Um, Lulu's a, a print on demand book service basically. And uh, we, we never worked with them, but we like the concept. And so we, we use them as an example when we play around with the ideas. Um, this was a sort of idea of like, if Lulu was gonna create some kind of concept about doing something to help encourage their authors to write more books, how would that, what would that service possibly be like? So rather than trying to code up the email or code up the web pages or anything like that, what we all did is sat around and we talked about what it would be like and we created a little storyboard and we walked through how it would be, what the experience would be like. It took about 10 minutes because we happened to have somebody who's a relatively good sketcher, although even with my horrible sketching skills, I could have put this together in about 15. Um, wouldn't have looked nearly as fine. But the text would have probably been there fine. And an artifact like this is, is actually far more functional than you might think. I mean, you can show this to a C-level executive at your company and have them sort of understand the experience that you're designing and sort of where you can take their money. You know, or you can show it to a user and have them quickly understand how this might fit into their life. Something, people really understand sort of like, like frame-based comic metaphors and they can quickly understand like, oh, I, can, I get how I'm gonna be involved in this. And the fact that this has a perspective, like you only, the only one of these, these blocks actually has a screen design on it. The last one has a bit of a button. The other one is actually show the person like at the computer with bubbles around it, kind of like giving an idea about, oh, this is what it's gonna be like when I'm dealing with this piece of software, right? Um, it, 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 it speaks more than a thousand words. It speaks 10,000 words because, because it really actually has a narrative and a story behind it. Programmers love comics too. This is, our <laughs> first, this is often our first round of user testing. Yeah. Or this kind of thing is, is often our first round of user testing. If, that makes, if, that, if that's helpful at all. But you can do this with designers and developers and it brings Brings, out, brings folks together in the process re relatively quickly and seamlessly. Um, and you can, 
you can do this prototyping stuff almost everywhere. We do a lot of it at the beginning, but um, you can do a lot of it during development. And like I said, it, it rolls into testing really quickly. Um, and it gets people on the same page. Um, that's the last thing we actually had on there, isn't it? That's it. Um, but we would love to talk to you. Now's the official question time. <laughs> so there better be at least one. If you want to yell at us, we're happy to be yelled at. Yeah, whatever you want. Well, we have one back there. What's been your experience with paper prototyping? It's been really useful. It's great. Yeah, it's super cheap. It's it's really really fast. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can you can crank out ten iterations in a day. Um, uh, people respond to it really really well. Um, uh, yeah, it's been great. We we have done it both um, uh, in person, sitting down with somebody and actually giving them physical pieces of paper, and maybe you know five five different screens on five different pieces. It also actually works pretty well remotely. Yeah. So setting up something like a WebEx or Adobe Connect and having people, you know, um, open up a PDF of a bunch of, of drawings and, and that kind of thing, and having them kind of talk to you about what that that means. Um, again, pair prototyping I think works best when it's not just screen designs, but it's sort of a story. It's a narrative about about a, the sort of task you're going to walk through. Yeah. Okay, quick follow up: How have you prepared the the user or the customer for that experience? We'd like to show you some concepts that we've been working on. They're just sketches, really, you know, and they literally are sketches. So if you say that to them, and most people are like, oh, I know what a sketch is. I know what a comic is. I don't think I've had a person yet say sort of like, oh, well, this isn't done or anything like yeah. that. I, don't, I think people kind of get it. They understand sort of their, their role there. Yeah. 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 Um, to kind of reconcile with the guy I kind of yelled at, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the actual process, you know, you give us preliminary information. Yeah. We go to work. Yeah. Okay. Agile is all about change. We we live for. Okay. So you come up, oh, that don't work. Okay. We make a change. Okay. So we go to work. They do their job. You, it it works. So. Yeah. To, to build on I think it's also it's about change, but it's also about reducing ambiguity. I mean, this is this these are great ways, great methods, great tools. For reducing ambiguity quickly early on in the project, right? And exactly. as many as much as you can do that, then then your iteration zero and one, or just one and two and three, whatever you do it, you proceed with much more accuracy. Not big design of front accuracy, but you reduce the you reduce the solution space to to an appropriate accurate range, as opposed to uh, frankly wasting a lot of money. Sure. I got two in the back there. Yeah, I just actually I want to touch a little bit on ambiguity. Deal with ambiguity every day, and um, so my question to you is, kind of bridging off the conversation that we had earlier, um, dealing with ambiguity and dealing with that within a sprint, user experience for you, does that live within the sprint or does that live outside the sprint and why? Does that question make sense? Training, do you want me to training to? Um, it's hard to think. So. I'll, I'll say that we kind of come from the consulting world, right? So we're we're always sort of coming from the space of being outside, right? We're never in, we're never inside, you know, in the in the team. We're not sitting with the team, that that sort of thing. So sort of with that perspective, it uh, in, in our engagements, it seems to work best that it works out of that sprint, that it works either um, sort of asynchronously, you know, we're we're like a sprint ahead, maybe, you know, doing doing some design work, doing some some sort of. Um, uh, level setting that then feeds into follow-on sprints. Um, in general, that that seems to be to be. And again, I, I put that caveat that that's sort of like the, the perspective we're coming from. And in an in-house team, I would I would say that you could probably do it where it's, it's actually within the sprint itself. But yeah, we don't have a lot of experience in that way. One well, one thing I can say that speaks to that is that um, our experience being able to see inside lots of organizations. That's one of the great things about being a consultant is you see the way a lot of people work. My experience has been that user experience work works best when as many people in the process are involved as early on as possible. So like the developers go out and do field research with you kind of thing. Um, often means the whole project is actually better in the end because everybody knows there's like communication over it disappears, which rapidly increases everything. And then everybody can actually be involved in the conversations in a, in a, at an equal footing. Um, so there's actually a, a big potential for having it be in, in the sense that like I could imagine I'm trying to feel if I, I feel like I've actually seen this, but I can't think where I've seen it before. Where 
you, like your earliest sprints are actually involving roughly the same team, even with the developers. But, and I know this may sound like sacrilege, but you you do a, a sprint or two without code, but you still make things. You know what I mean? Like you're still making the sketches, you're still making the stuff, and then you transition to coding something as soon as it makes sense. But the idea is that it's the same team iterating through the ideas towards something that is getting more fidelity and more tangible and more towards the code as soon as you can. But it's not a handoff because everybody's involved. I've seen that. I, I can't for like well, no, no, so I, I have an exact example. And actually, this is, this maybe can turn, be turned back into a question for the, the guy in the, the, the corner over there who was asking 20 minutes ago about, oh, well, you know, if we're off and you're doing our research, can we do any code, right? Um, I, I worked on a couple of projects. I worked on one that three weeks ago, we had front-end developers and the designers sitting in the same room, spending two days, and the, the artifacts were whiteboards and sketches, right? There was not a line of, of code written. There was no intention to. So and I feel like that worked incredibly well. It got, it got some really good understanding. It's making us work really fast. The, the front-end developers have a lot of buy-off on what, what they're going to be ultimately building because they help to come up with the concepts. So my question back to you is then, is that okay? So <laughs> just to, so, so I work at a full fledged piece called Software. Okay. And so I basically travel in all, of course all my projects are traveling all over the world yeah. and different yeah. countries and yeah. so forth. And so I recently actually worked on a project where we worked in, we were in several, we worked in four countries, but we were in two countries. And there was a lot of travel and different, big, big different organizations and so forth. And um, so on that project, I was pairing with a uh, developer. So the developer was with me on that iteration. And the developer was the one who could tell me, now is the time when we can start to add value by building. Yep. Yep. And so the point that I'm making there is that from your perspective, even though, uh, look, there are a few more highly skilled UI design, UX designers in the world than people have had that past. I mean, I have no greater respect for you know, the work you guys do. We just grew up a lot. But, no, but no, in all it's seriously. But the thing that is lost there is an understanding of when is the right time to start to build? And when can we, when are we not adding more value by just sketching and doing all these things we've talked about? These are great and I do them myself. Mm -hmm. What are we going to start adding more value by actually coding? Mm -hmm. and that was the point that I was made, trying to make earlier. Yeah. So to me, that is all this stuff is, is great. I mean, ninety percent of all this is good. That's the <laughs> piece that is missing. That so that's the ten percent is um, you need to have a developer be part, actively participating in that process oh, yeah. to say, you know what, we need to do a code iteration. Yeah. I agree. Uh, the question of when should we start coding is exactly the right question to be asking there. I, 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 I admit, the, the only thing we want to say is don't assume that today is the day. Like, don't assume that that's today. But everybody, like, that's, as soon as you can get to the code, as soon as it makes sense, it is the right time, you know, because there's no reason to just keep doing things on paper when it's not really getting there. So yeah, I think we actually do agree. Uh, it just seemed like, you know, you had to define the problem before you solve it. And usually, you've got, you already know what roughly the problem is. You've got, well, there's a niche for this product. Let's figure out, you know, so you do your sprint zero, narrow that down enough to get enough information of what the problem is to start. It sounded like with that research project, you didn't even know what the problem was. Not that, not as well. It was, actually what it was is it was just a really, really big problem. It wasn't a small thing they were trying to develop and design. It was a really big thing. And so the problem was really big and it was So they wanted to make sure that we, that, but it was an unusual project. Like I said, I, I don't do those every, every project is not like that one, it's just one. But it was a great example for me of what, when it really, really made sense to say, let's step back for a second and make it sure. Although honestly, for that project, um, if I had a design technologist, I didn't have one on that project, I didn't, didn't have for that client, I would have loved to have started coding some stuff sooner. Than, than, it, than it did, I would have loved to. But I would have probably waited until it was eight weeks and then I would have started, because the project was actually months and months and months. Right, but, but, but say by the end of the eight weeks, you probably also didn't know exactly what the product was needed to do. You just we had did. this <coughs> research. We knew a lot about the people. Yeah, yeah. a lot of insights. And then yeah, it took a few more weeks for us to get some concepts. Yeah, once we had some concepts, it was exactly the time.
Go if you want to. We're going to keep talking about it.